Can you see that, folks? I mean, are we, everyone's able to see it in full screen mode? Yeah, we can. I can actually. All right, excellent. Um, okay, so we're here to chat about the role of artificial intelligence within product marketing. And um, in order to get to that point, there'll be a little bit of background and we'll figure out some of, some of the, the business case of it. So broadly, at the end of this session, I hope that you will be able to take with you a 15 minute sort of generative AI business case for marketing as a whole and more specifically for you know product marketing. And one minute, sorry, I'm going to do this. All right, there we are. Um, more specifically for product marketing. The second part that we will touch on is um, ChatGPT and why ChatGPT is because it is, they are the inventors of this particular version that seems to have taken the world by storm. They are the ones that are making themselves available at a very large cost, I'm assuming, because they uh, are making it free at certain levels. So let's start learning there and then move it across. There are a number of other options we can explore as well. And then the last part of what I will touch on today is specifically using ChatGPT to customize content for specific customer segments. So to introduce myself, part of my claim to fame, fame <laughs> is uh, the fact that I host a podcast called the 4am report. In the 4am report, we have asked founders and marketers for about 200 episodes, what keeps you up at night? And the answers to those are, are very interesting. Like we've had like meaty marketing problems. We've had business problems. We've had people like, I think two out of 200 who said like they sleep like a baby and we want to know their secrets for sure. Um, and like, we've had wit, we've had fun, we've had interesting things. And so in the process of that, you get a lot of insights into what literally customers are thinking about. And lately, as we keep asking those questions to more and more folks, the answer tends to, to be something to do with AI or artificial intelligence. So let's get into it. Whether people are thinking, you know, I haven't used it or people are like, I'm using it, but I'm not getting the best out of it. Or people are saying, oh, I tried it, but I don't know how exactly to operationalize and bring better stuff out of it. Or, you know, potentially like, oh, I'm concerned about the security risks. Or if you look at the news headlines around you, perhaps you're seeing things like, you know, these tech giants have used many people's intellectual property to train artificial intelligence. And so now folks are coming out and saying, well, they should be compensated for that kind of thing. So there's a lot in the headlines. If we get distracted by things outside of our control, I think we lose sight of what it is that we can each do with this. And it's a very exciting time, in my opinion, to be alive. And it's much like when the internet came out and like, why wouldn't you use it is the way I like to think about it. So um, I promise to introduce myself a little bit more fully. This is me. That's my book over there on the left. It's called Onboarding, Take Your Content Marketing from Blah to Brilliant. And you'll find it in all the places where books are sold um, internationally. I run, I, I, I have, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called C Plus B Digital. We are content marketers. We build communities. We've created categories for ourselves and our clients. And currently, we are bravely, I'm um, practicing some of what I preach to all of my clients. And I'm trying to bravely step forward and say, you know, what we're doing right now, nobody knows the answers to all the things in AI. But like, I'd like to try. I'd like to develop some mastery in that area. And so defining what it looks like to be an AI agency is, is where we are at right now. Um, as I said, I'm the host of a podcast called The 4AM Report, but also my sacred work as an immigrant who lives, uh, I'm joining you from Toronto, Canada, as an immigrant who's made Canada my home, um, is seeing a lot of the inequities that are around. And I have a uh, 12 year old daughter. And, you know, as I start to look at life from her eyes, I find myself wanting to do more and more things to change the state of the world. So the ABC DEI podcast comes from there, which I co-host with the very awesome PR Maven. Um, so that's the podcasting. 
The book is over here on the left. Uh, we're the facilitators of a few communities and I run a program called the AI Advantage, which is artificial intelligence, um, you know, literacy and how do we get to a place where we all deploy it equally and use it to our best benefit. Tell you a bit about that later. So prepare to look at this screen for a while because we're going to spend a little bit of time on this one. Um, I see a little note in the chat, so I'll keep. Okay, so please use the Q and A box. Just reminding everyone, if you if you have any questions, just drop them here, and uh, we'll get to them in breaks in the conversation. All right. So once again, going back to the headlines, if you look at the headlines around you, you'd be forgiven for thinking that artificial intelligence was like just invented. Like as of December last year, somebody came up with the concept, but that's really not true. Like artificial intelligence has been available in different formats for a very long time, potentially like 50 years. Uh, more recently, the things that we would recognize, what's familiar in everyday life for many of us is things like, like, Siri on your phone or Alexa or Google smart speakers. Um, and if you're talking in the marketing and content creation space, there's tools like Grammarly that we've used to check um, typos, things like otter.ai that we've used to get transcriptions. Um, and even very similar in the generative AI space, tools like Jasper, which are paid tools, they, it was pretty you know, rubbish as a tool at one point, but it's getting to a place where it's really, really good um, because they've made some partnerships with ChatGPT's competitors. So really, I think remembering that artificial intelligence is not new. Predictive sentences have featured in things like Google Docs for a very long time. Autocorrect on our phone is very much an example of it. So if we start to think about the fact that this is just a better version of what we always had. And instead of getting into like a battle of wills over will the machine replace humans, et cetera, let's stay in the in the business case arena. Like how can we use this? So to explain the tech, I'm not, I'm many, many folks here are in the product uh, marketing space, in the um, in the SaaS space. So you potentially know the space that we're talking about. Artificial intelligence in itself is essentially the idea of getting programs to think at scale the way a human would. So that's the simplest explanation that I, as a non-tech person, can find for myself. Within artificial intelligence comes machine learning, which is the concept of patterning. Like you take large volumes of data, you start to see patterns within it. And then those patterns, when you predict it, that's the machine learning how it is that these data sets work, right? And then finally, there's generative AI, which is often people are, get a little bit mixed up about what it is. And um, I've heard many comparisons from, from gurus about how this is like high speed searches. Like, you know, this is gonna, this is like, you know, instead of getting a bunch of search listings on Google, you're gonna get like summaries from ChatGPT. And that is possible. But, and it is definitely a use case, but that is not what it is. It's not giving you only material that you already have. And I'll explain what that means in a second. So why then did ChatGPT become such a big phenomenon? And other than the fact that Meta or Facebook launched their, their version of Twitter, which is called Threads, other than that, nothing has created like millions of users in the first weekend of launching, right? And so why is it that something like ChatGPT has got those results? Why did so many people jump on it and continue to use it? Um, it's it's a couple of things or three things really. Number one, it it is pretty credible. Like it'll it'll give you vast amounts of credible text. So if you go and ask it, even at a very, very basic level, like write me a 500 blog, a word blog post on product marketing, and it's going to instantly do that. And then you're going to see it in seconds, like happen right in front of your eyes. And what I think separates them from a couple of earlier options is the fact that the quality of the content or the credibility of the content is, is better. So that's the first. The second is the user experience itself. They've called it chat GPT. It's an easy chat format. We're all used to, you know, inputting things into like various forms of search and chat. And that's what they're using. They're using our ability to do this 
to improve sort of our adoption of it, right? So, and then the last part is that the, the basic version continues to remain free. And I think um, the proposition of, of having a freebie, uh, a free model or a freemium model is, is successful for a reason. And I think they're leveraging it really well. So the next point then becomes, what is the reaction to it? Like after initially jumping on with both feet, like with many, many things, um, Gartner's cycle, hype cycle, talks about how you've got something that comes in, a whole bunch of people will jump on it. And then there's the trough of disillusionment. And that's what it's called. It's like when people fall away, the millions and millions of people who signed up for chat GPT accounts are like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm over it. I really don't know. Because the tool is powerful in the hands of the handler, right? And if you don't actually know what to do with it, it's just a lot of firepower for, for no real reason. So after the fall away, there are a lot of people who've continued. Like I'm certainly a proponent of, I think the true business opportunities, the true ability to use it, um, and the real you know workflows will start to make themselves known to the folks who sort of stick around past the hype phase and find ways to utilize it. So while the market is a little bit like, you know, there's a lot of um, doom and gloom out there and there's all of these like big voices who are like, let's halt the development of AI and this is too much too soon, et cetera. Um, and my reaction to that folks is quite simply, that's like standing in the middle of an avalanche and trying to stop it because it's too late. Like there's a lot of things that already exist and saying, let's take a, a step back at this point is a bit late. So let's not concern ourselves with the with the absolutes. Let's concern ourselves with uh, what I'm calling the missing piece, which is that robotic process automation has been a thing for tasks that involve the body for a really long time. Like things like packaging and moving and stock and distribution and logistics have changed so much because of robotic process automation. So why then are we resisting the idea of robotic process automation for what is essentially the human mind, right? The, the creative mind. And so that's the missing piece that I think we should just like, I'm foreshadowing to that for, for a second. So here is a piece of fake news. Often you'll hear that generative AIs can only spit out existing stuff and that somehow the material that you're creating with things like chat GPT are just regurgitated stuff that the machine spits out at you. And that's not true. It is actually a little bit uh, unsafe to believe that that is true. You really need to think about why it is that everything is new. And to explain that, I find it easier to think about it from the perspective of the design side of things. So let's go, for example, to OpenAI's own visual artificial intelligence tool, which is called Dolly. So on Dolly, if you get in there and you give it a prompt, such as like, I don't know, like a cat um, in a unicorn suit, that is sitting on a pool floaty and having a cocktail, it will give you an image. It's currently paid, but it'll give you an image. That image is original. Are there cats? Are there unicorn floaties? Are there cocktails? Are there composites that people have created of all of these things? Yes, but that particular idea and that particular way in which it is put together um, you know, you need to realize that it's not going to be exactly the same each time. And even you yourself, when you provide that kind of prompt, it, it sort of like, um, comes out different each time. So that put that lens onto words and that's what you're getting with chat GPT. I'm going to look at the questions over here. I've got a couple. Well, um, all right. So there's one question. Is it true that chat GPT just got dumber? <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> i think here's here's how i like to answer that i think we are getting smarter <laughs> and so uh so we ask questions that tend to to show up more and more examples of 
of why this machine is not absolute, right? And, and why at the end, the, the caveat that I'm about to talk about right now, which is that garbage in, garbage out. This is true for like anything. It's true for any creative task. It's true for any briefing. Um, but often you'll find with a machine, there's nowhere to hide, right? Like whatever you put in there is what you're going to get. So yes, I would say um, there are more and more sophisticated needs that are getting unearthed. There's certainly the, the one of the problems that I see with ChatGPT, with Bard, which I've also used. I haven't tried cloud yet. Um, but what I've noticed is that there's a tendency to hallucinate. They call it hallucinate, but it's basically, you know, make make crap up and answer it if it doesn't know the answer. So um, it's easy enough to, to perceive that as if they don't know all the answers. And then secondly, what are the best plugins for ChatGPT and how do we find the best plugins? Um, the plugins are in the paid version of ChatGPT. One of the plugins that I've been using, it's nothing to do with marketing or product marketing that I find it really, really useful in my life to save my time is the Instacart plugin. So if you go and ask this thing, and I do this on a regular basis, if you go and ask ChatGPT to give you like a list of things to cook and ask it to pull up recipe plugins from, for example, I don't know, Tasty or any other large um, creator that's made, I mean, creative organization that's made recipes available it'll pull in from there and then it'll populate your grocery list and send it directly if you have an account so I find that kind of thing to be quite useful there are a few SEO plugins that have um, got rave reviews from some of my peer set there are a couple of coding ones so I think you need to search go out there and look. I think Reddit is a great source to go and look for a couple of chat GPT boards, join them. And a lot of information is available. People cannot wait. I think it's bringing out a level of excitement. Like I previously briefly mentioned, it's bringing out a level of excitement. That's kind of like when the internet came out. So there's a lot of discovery that is available if we go out there and look. All right. So back over here then to the part about garbage in garbage out as like yes chat gpt can create original thoughts yes chat gpt can become robotic process automation for the creative mind the caveat is this you've got to make sure that you're giving it good material and which is why in my opinion and the opinion of many others um in the practitioner space rather than the creator of the tools the idea that you want to learn how to prompt is a very important one. Like the ability to create good prompts, become your own sort of prompt engineer and create good follow-ups and conversations with generative AI will be one of the finest skills that you can teach yourself as you, you know, progress in 2023 and beyond. So reminder then of this big perspective, if there's one thing we've, we've done in this 15 minutes, it's this. Think of it as robotic process automation for the creative mind. There are a number of things that you do in marketing over and over again, and we'll get into it in the in as I explain the, um, the examples. There are a lot of things that you can simplify using a machine. So shut out the noise, people, and start thinking about generative AI in general as and uh, in this in this conversation, Chat GPT in particular. Think about it like how you know. Iron Man treats Jarvis. It's like a really powerful machine and you don't have to do every bit of hard work yourself. You can rely on machines and it's, you know, it's going to save up your space to stay in your zone of genius. And I know it's scary at first for many folks, but I really don't think we should stop because of it. Do it anyway, even if it's scary. So here is the, uh, in my opinion, the AI business case for product marketers. I like to tell it as a story to say why it's always tempting for folks to be like, okay, a new technology has come out. Let's try and make more and more technology. Let's stay in the tech space. Let's try to make a faster, better, cheaper technology. So a lot of folks will do that. And I'll tell you why, instead of us being those folks, we need to be the folks who put it to work. The story of the refrigerator is a good one. When the refrigerator was first created, it was created to obviously keep life-saving drugs cold so that they could be you know, transported from one place to the other and then made available to people beyond maybe um, the geography 
where the drugs were available. This was in the 1800s, I believe 1830. And then for close to 100 years, I think it remained much in the same space. And there were people who tried to obviously do exactly what I said is like bring down the cost of these things and make better ones and make it last longer and stuff. The true winners though, were not the folks who were in the space of making a better refrigerator. The true winners were people in the food and beverage space, including firms like the Coca-Cola company and many others who were like, what if we took that technology and found a way to apply it to our business? And right now, maybe our food is only being sold in one place. What happens if we, we you know, widen that using the ability to keep food cold. And so out of that was born the global food supply chain. You know, groceries came out of it, the ability to keep food cold. The idea of a cold drink on a hot day um, came about because somebody was like, why do refrigerators only need to be used for keeping medication cold? Um, and that's kind of where we are at, I think. And if we can all start to think about it like that, like how can we take this apply it to our own business and then like gain exponential impact results revenues like whatever it is that um you seek so that is the backdrop any other questions in here just pop over here and have a little look uh all right i think we got to those couple of questions feel free to you know drop me more notes here as we go. If you're finding this interesting so far, perhaps you will find the AI advantage useful and you may want to take advantage of one of the programs that we offer. Haha, <laughs> funds take advantage. Uh, this is a premium content product that I offer. Um, there's a QR code if you'd like to scan that. It covers off many AI products, are specifically prompt libraries and having just a prompt library is kind of like having um, a dictionary. Like unless you know what you're looking for, it's just a lot of words, right? So a prompt library with specific tutorials and AI literacy, and then on top of it with the strategic marketing plays as well is what I'm offering. Um, it's a 12 month premium content program. And it literally hits the trifecta of what people talk to me about all the time, which is saving time, coming up with like ways in which you can take the piddly stuff off your plate so that you can stay in your zone of genius on what truly matters in business. Um, I've put a couple of testimonials up here. And once again, that's the QR code up there if you'd like to check it out. Onwards to ways in which we can use ChatGPT within product marketing. Obviously, this is a one hour um, masterclass, webinar, whatever you'd like to call it. And there's a limit on how much we can cover. So I was hoping to just stay in one space. So we'll look at what that is. Let me bring this down here. Here we go. Prompting. I mentioned briefly that the finest skill that you can teach yourself is prompting. And while many folks are selling, like I said, prompt libraries, even if you get one of those, you need to formulate your own ability to think through the critical thinking, the problem solving, the workflow. That's where like the magic is. That said, the easiest way to acquaint yourself with generative AI and to get comfortable using something like ChatGPT is a master prompt like this. The master prompt is quite simple. It asks the machine to ask you questions. You can specify if you like how many questions, but the the idea is that this machine already knows how to do a bunch of things and we we have no clue. We've not even begun to scratch the surface of what's possible with all of this. So ask it, like tell it to tell you what to do, right? Help me help you kind of thing. So here's, a, here's an example. I'd like to, and you can put in a goal here, improve my business's product marketing strategy. Can you ask me questions to help me identify potential areas for improvement, target audience insights, and innovative ideas to enhance customer engagement and drive conversions? So this is very, very basic, very top level. I have put one or two things in there. 
when you don't have to. You can start with a less um, detailed one even. And then remember, remember it's called chat GPT for a reason. So you can chat with it. So if it comes back with something, they've even within the uh, AI, uh, sorry, the interface, the UX has like uh, a like or a dislike. I find that to be a little absolute. What they've also done is they've created um, an edit button. So once you put in a prompt, you're able to go back into the prompt and change it. And you can also sort of regenerate a response. So don't feel the need to know all of the words for the question. Start with something. And an easy way to start, like I said, is a master prompt. Onwards, do a little bit more nuance within like your general, your top level prompt models. There are a lot of models. And again, feel free to ask ChatGP to tell you what some of those models are in your specific space. But here are two that I find really great to use. One is a role play sort of model and one is a problem solving model. So within a role play model, um, you're asking it to behave like someone. So in the space of like product marketing, for example, think of like Gary Vaynerchuk. And if you want to say something like, act as if you're Gary V and give me advice on how to do X things with X company. And when you say, ask me questions, like yell at me, like Gary Vaynerchuk yells at people, um, maybe it will. So here you have a question. AI is built on process data and the ability to predict responses based on patterns. But what will happen if there is an influx of data, too much data? Um, I, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know what will happen. I just have to believe that people will get smarter and smarter in the applications of these things. And if, if the speed at which people have moved, because OpenAI came up, created chat GPT sort of disrupted the market, right? And then look how quickly things are happening. In under six months, all of the other, other folks are coming in with their own version of it. And then they're sort of pointing out flaws within each other's models. And there's this like, you know, this free for all democratic approach to things right now. And I think that's kind of what's gonna happen eventually. If, if we get to a place where there's too much data, there'll, there'll be people who will come forward with our with solutions is my hope. <laughs> so like I said, you know, use the tool that's in front of us. And as we use it, we put more intelligence into the system and that's going to drive the change as well. So back then to the two prompt models, the first is the role play, which I touched on. And then the second is the problem solving. Like think about coming to it with a specific issue, like X business is struggling with Y problem. And I want you to do you know, whatever, give it some actions. Like um, a, a business in inventory management software is struggling with customer retention. And I would like you to give me three possible solutions. That's how you you start prompting it at a, at a top level. So these are three. Then there's a master prompt in these two general models that are loads, folks. I want to stress like this is very infinite. Like there's no ceiling on these things. It's as much or as little as you want. But I, I find it helps to narrow our focus to a few things so that we can get really good at using it in one or two ways and then expand. Because if not, you're just going to overwhelm yourself. So let's say personalization. Like suppose there's a, a, a product out there that needs to go to market. Um, and you know, you've got like multiple customer segments, right? And you, you're like, perhaps getting a little bit overwhelmed. You're like, of course you can personalize and, you know, instead of going straight off and trying to segment your lists and send out content, perhaps you need to start by creating the strategy first. And that's something I find documenting strategy is a huge strength. That's going to come to many of us, um, because of tools like chat GPT, because, you'll end up not just thinking things in your head, but putting it down and talking to the machine in a way that you can move it over and create guides and documents and outlines and systems. This is gonna go a long way towards making that happen for ourselves, right? And um, in our own firm and for our clients, we've certainly been using it to outline service level agreements to, to make sure that certain steps are followed in the process of delivering something like a podcast on a weekly basis. So there's a lot that you can do to document 
processes and systematization. So start by creating a personalization strategy and ask it, ask the machine to write it for you. Next, think about using like, tailored content like you know if you say this is my specific segment and I would like to take this segment and write only for them for example blog posts like if you're dealing with manufacturing industry CFOs for a product instead of just all CFOs you know how would you start to talk to them in their language and then chat GPT can help you generate that kind of tailored content and then the next step perhaps is Going back to the idea of prompting, remember why it is that ChatGPT calls itself ChatGPT because it wants you to chat with it. The reason the whole thing has been built in an interface of chatting is so that you can go back and forth. Um, and you know, the the ability to refine your own technique in the prompting of it, I think, is pretty important. Uh, can it still be called AI if its responses are filtered? I thought the idea is to create AI in our image. Um, <laughs> again, a good question. Can it be called AI? Yes, it can be called. It can be called AI. Because think about, here's how I like to think about filtered. Um, there are so many thoughts that cross the human mind, but we've learned how to filter it and say the right things in the right spaces. And that's context and that's emotional intelligence. And while machines lack that, the boundaries come from somewhere. And I know that one of the big problems that a lot of folks have with generative AI, such as ChatGPT, is the fact that it comes with inherent bias on a number of levels, right? And um, even the process of correcting the bias is going to need filters on a few levels. So once again, remains to be seen. Here are a couple of prompts that I want to touch on for perhaps using the personalization strategy. So here's how I would start if I were doing this. I'd be, as a business catering to multiple customer segments, how can I effectively personalize my content to resonate with each group and drive engagement? Like start at the very top and then practice what I told you in terms of the master prompt, for example, and say, ask me 20 questions so that we can generate compelling content that speaks directly to the ideal client profile. And when you start in this way, it's going to give you a lot of blather. One thing I can tell you with generative AI like this is it sounds super impressive. And I believe it's somebody else's words. They're like, it's a whole lot of excellent sounding garbage. And that's totally possible, <laughs> which is where you have to specify. So if you asked a question like this and it gave you a lot of genetic points, you need to say, can you please focus on point number two and give me more? So that's another piece of context you can give um, the machine is pull out what it's saying to you that you like or you want to dive deeper into and ask it to give you some more detail. I've got a couple more questions here that I'm going to jump into. Prompts created by GPT has a digital footprint, which sometimes causes issues with SEO and flagging it not unique. Is there a way to counter this? Uh, yes, there are a couple of ways to counter it. All content created by AI alone, if you copy and paste it in its exact format, is going to be searchable because people like Google and other search engines are trying to find ways in which they can flag this content because they don't want you to be putting vast quantities of content, which is not well done. So the number one thing you're going to do is you're going to bring human intelligence to it. Do not just put out exactly what the machine gives you. You definitely, 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 I can't say enough definitely, need to put your own brain into it. So while you wanted to do a lot of the grunt work for you, a lot of the robotic process automation, you're not getting final drafts out of it, either for plans or for articles and content and marketing material to go out there. You're definitely going to put yourself into the process. So for example, previously, if you started at zero and you were doing all the work from zero to 100, right now using a machine, it's going to get you to a place where you're 60 or 75, depending on how you get better and better at the prompting. But you still need to do the last 30% yourself. You still need to do the last 40% yourself. So I think bringing that human element into it is the number one piece of like advice I have for anyone who's like, you know, how do we combat getting flagged as, you know, machine generated content? 
Number two, there are tools out there which will change some words. So it's kind of like, it's not ideal, but it is a way of changing a few words so that the pattern is interrupted and you know artificial intelligence detectors cannot find it. So there are a few, I can't remember any of them offhand, but I do wanna give you this hack. Ask the machine to do it. Ask ChatGPT to rewrite whatever it is that you wanna use from ChatGPT and say, act as a, you know, blah, blah, blah. Act as a AI detection software from the likes of Google and rewrite this in a way that it cannot be detected. And I promise you it'll work. But like I said, very rarely are you going to grab a full entire bit of text generated by, you know, something like ChatGPT and just throw it on the interweb and be like, this is, this is great. This is original and this is what I created. You always bring at least 20 to 30 percent to it. And so I think that's going to help avoid that sort of detection. Um, any other questions at this point? Because that's, you know, that's a, a the bulk of what it is that I wanted to, to walk through with you. Um, I'd like to get into questions right now if anyone has any more. Um, if not, we can just go back and review any sections if anyone wants that. Yeah, so if you guys have questions, this is the time to like ask Susan. But I think it has really been so interactive because a lot of questions has already been answered. Yeah, and shared. Okay, there is one. One just came in now. Right. Um, changing words, it. paraphrasing, still comes with digital footprints. Something yeah, like it's still it. Yeah, it still does. There are ways in which you can get around it with changing up the formats and changing up the words. But yeah, it's true. The like I said, the only real way to get around that is to add enough quality inputs as the human, like take it to a 60 to 70% um, and do the rest yourself. Like in the end, think of it like this is the first time this is becoming available to people as the wider masses. And as we keep using it, we'll just figure out more and more ways to get around the problems in front of us. Okay, another question. Yep. Is there a place that shows the third-party plugins? Are they accessible through a premium or do I uh, go to some? Yeah, if you get the premium of ChatGPT, it's actually available right there. So if you go uh, into the ChatGPT thing, it shows you 3.5 or 4, for, meaning uh, GPT model 3.5 or 4. And then under that, it says plugins. Until about two weeks ago, ChatGPT was also offering browsing. I'm not sure if you folks were aware in the premium model and it was great, but they found a number of problems with it, including the fact that it was getting around paywalls and that was causing a lot of issue, um, as well as a lot of like the hallucination problem of just making stuff up. So they have taken that off. So the browse with Bing beta has gone, but right below um, where you pick the model, whether you're using GPT 3.5 or 4, it also allows you to pick plugins. So the first time that you use it and you want to pick plugins, it'll ask you to choose the ones that you want. They have a plugin library of all the ones that they've integrated with, but more and more folks are creating plugins. So I think that it's a, it's a good idea to check it out from time to time, but it's only in the premium model, folks. And the premium model is $20 a month. And many people say that that, that, you know, that's a significant amount, especially because you can access GPT-4 through other tools. Like there's tools like Write Sonic and a few others. There's ways to get around it and hack it. But here's my thinking on it. Like these people, OpenAI, they're the creators of this, this concept. They're the ones who uh, brought it to market with this level of us. Awesome. We're talking product marketing and like, let's watch the way they've done it. They've done a phenomenal job and I'm all about compensating the creator for the creations they have. Like somebody made this product and I honor it and I pay $20 a month to use it. Cause you know, one of the things as far as I'm concerned is I cannot go out and create that literacy and um, bring people with me and say, you know, here are ways to put it to work if I don't actually use some of the versions um, that I'm talking about. So that's my perspective. Here we go, we've got a couple question. more. What is your take on AI taking people's jobs? Um, 
<laughs> I think we're we're still a long way away from that, folks. I don't think AI is going to be taking our jobs. Um, maybe maybe our grandchildren's jobs. Just kidding, but you know, I don't think so. I think that's too absolute for my perspective. I think it's going to get to a place where we stop being freaked out by the machines and we start to think about ways in which we can do stuff that we're not competing. Like our big abilities as humankind, and maybe I get a bit philosophical here. Our big abilities are like empathy and emotional intelligence and kindness and critical thinking and those kind of things are never going to be replaced by a machine so the more time we spend in our true zone of genius and the less time we spend doing like tasks like formatting and getting a lot of material together like earlier a marketing assistant would take a week to get together some materials that I would need for certain kinds of analysis. And right now I can put in parameters and get that kind of information in like 40 minutes, like even with the back and forth and the conversations. Um, and I think that's what we need. Does that mean AI assistants are not going to exist? Sorry, marketing assistants are not going to exist. Does that mean that we'll never have junior people, places for people to start from and learn. It's, no, that's not what it means. It means they will start at a higher level, like junior marketers of the future will not spend hours and hours and hours, you know, scrolling through websites and trying to see if an article has any information of value, right? They'll start by getting to a place where they get ChatGPT to do stuff like that. So that's my thinking about, I don't think we're anywhere close to AI replacing humans as it stands right now. Um, the next question, would you recommend migrating to the premium model since the whole problem of hallucination still persists? I think, yes, I do. I do recommend that. And hopefully I answered part of that question when I said that I feel the usage of GPT-4 is a, is a premium thing. So number one, that. Number two, the thing that I find is really helpful is it's available at all times. Because um, sometimes when you're using the free one, it'll be offline. It'll say chat GPT is at capacity. And the reason for that is because this is, it costs money. Like this is a whole lot of computing power that goes into each of those queries, right? And ChatGPT and OpenAI, their creators clearly have deep pockets and investors, and that's how they're able to make it free. So uh, when they do have their paid version, it's 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 a way to just keep the product improving. As far as halluc hallucinations are concerned, I think just deeper level of querying, like go back and forth with it. Like if something is coming in and it's like, it's clearly not true, or you've asked it for one of the places where I will see hallucinations a lot is when you ask it to find information that is search related, like the cutoff for GPT is um, September of 2021, I believe. So they only have information from before that. So if you ask it a question that requires putting together research after that time, sometimes it'll come back with a bunch of hallucinations and give you info and it'll give you links and things, um, but it's not doing it from a current search perspective. So asking more questions um, will solve that. What about people with jobs like translation, driving, and more? What is to be of them? I know, I know. I wish I had all of the answers to all of life's questions. I think when it comes to things like translation um, and driving, those are things, jobs are already being changed in that area. Hopefully that language ability that that person has, it will be used in a way that is superior rather than just doing it through translating one word to the other. But, you know, once again, humility from all of us is necessary. And I, for sure, do not know the answers to all of these questions. And in some ways, looking at ourselves as like we do, for whatever reason, have the privilege to be sitting in this room and learning about these things. Um, hopefully someone in here can find solutions to how this can be deployed more equitably in a way that more people um, are safe through the transition. Yeah, so I think um, we basically exhausted every question at this point. Thank and you. honestly, Susan, you've done such a good job. This is um, so enlightening, at least. AI is not going to take our jobs anytime soon. So everyone, please relax. <laughs> 
put your mind at ease and just do your job to, you know, to our grandchildren's age. <laughs> so thank you so much, Susan. <laughs> thank you all for contributing. This has been like a very good discussion. Like there's so much interaction, these questions, there's, you know, we talked about several things and I just like the entire flow of the whole webinar or business series. So thank you so much, Susan, for coming on here, bringing the amazing energy, the warmth, like we could literally feel from your session, there was so much warmth, there was so much good vibes and energy, and you were just so happy sharing with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you to every attendee that joined us today. Um, this is the Diana Business Series, and today we had Susan as a guest, and it has been the bump. Thank you all for joining, and do well to thank like have you. a very beautiful weekend. Yeah, <laughs> everyone is saying thanks for the answers. Arigato. Thank please, you. you can say thank you to Susan in the chat. Also, if you have your social media handles, please do well to like yes. share with the audience so that we could do well to like follow you and keep talking about AI on your walls. <laughs> Love yeah. it. I think uh, I mean, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn an incredibly long amount of time in each day. I, I mean, an unhealthy amount of time, I think. Um, so feel free to connect with me there. I will drop it in the chat box as well. Uh, and thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for Bye. joining has been good. Bye, guys. Have a lovely, lovely weekend. Please follow Susan on LinkedIn. Bye.